Iliocaval Venous Thrombosis in a Patient with IVC Filter by Robert Adoran, Associate Professor, Yale University. This is a case of a 44-year-old woman who presented with acute bilateral leg pain and edema and was found to have an acute extensive deep vein thrombosis involving both legs. She presented in mid-April 2020. On exam, she had painful edema and discoloration in both legs, worse on the right. Her Villalta score was 16. She had a history of an unprovoked pulmonary embolism occurring twice with a negative hypercoagulable workup prior. She was status post IVC filter implant eight years prior with an unclear indication. She had discontinued her anticoagulation after three years due to her own fears of potential bleeding, but her IVC filter was never retrieved. She also had a history of hypothyroidism and hyperlipidemia. She had a family history of heart disease, but no hypercoagulable state. She was a pack per day smoker for the past almost 10 years. Her venous ultrasound of April 15th revealed extensive occlusive thrombus bilaterally from the external iliac veins down to the distal femoral veins. There was non-occlusive thrombus within the left popliteal vein and the posterior and tibial and perineal veins were compressible. CT angiography revealed no pulmonary embolism. However, distal to the filter, there was complete thrombosis of the inferior vena cava, bilateral common and external internal iliac veins. There was edema within retroperitoneal soft tissues. And the IVC above the level of the filter was pain. Initially, the patient was admitted and maintained on a heparin infusion, but her pain and edema persisted overnight. On April 17th, we performed the first catheter procedure. With the patient prone, bilateral popliteal veins were accessed using ultrasound. A 16 French sheath on the left and a 20 French sheath on the right were inserted. Venography, aided by IVUS, revealed thrombotic occlusion, most severely focused in the right femoral vein, common femoral vein, iliac vein, and the left common femoral vein into the iliac vein. There was also thrombus around the IVC filter. The venogram still images from the left and the right shown here demonstrate the occlusive nature of the thrombus. Intravascular ultrasound here reveals the near occlusive thrombus seen within an iliac vein. With the patient heparinized, we utilize the clot retriever device. A 13 French device was used to perform multiple runs into the bilateral iliac veins, common femoral veins, into the femoral veins. We also use the flow retriever device a 22 French to run from the IVC below the filter. Aspiration thrombectomy of the IVC and right common iliac veins was also performed with copious volumes of thrombus removed. Eventually we restored flow, although there still was thrombus burden up to the IVC filter. We laid out the thrombus extracted on a table. In fact, there was an additional table with an equivalent amount of thrombus retrieved as well. As the patient had an IVC filter, 
we did not advance the claw retriever device up into the inferior vena cava for the risk of getting entangled with the filter with our device. Instead, we used the up and over technique as shown here to perform contralateral and ipsilateral thrombus withdrawal. The intravascular ultrasound image on the right shows the partial resolution of thrombus within the left external iliac vein. The venogram on the right shows that despite residual thrombus burden, improved flow is noted. The patient was discharged on post-procedure day one on a treatment dose in oxyparin of one milligram per kilogram twice a day subcutaneously. I saw the patient at one week follow-up on April 24th. She reported no residual pain or edema. Her Vilalta score was now down to one and she was maintained on an oxyparin for a total of four weeks, then switched to a direct oral anticoagulant. The patient was brought back on May 20th for an elective second procedure. One, to attempt IVC filter retrieval as the filter was no longer indicated. The filter incidentally was noted to be tilted and this procedure was not successful and aborted. We also plan to perform intravascular ultrasound of the deep venous system to look for any occult stenoses. IVIS revealed a left common iliac vein stenosis. The lesion was predilated with a 16 millimeter balloon after which a 16 by 60 Venovo venous stent was deployed and post dilated with the same balloon. Intravascular ultrasound revealed good stent expansion with a gain in lumen area of up to 200 millimeters squared in the common iliac segment and 150 millimeters squared within the external iliac vein. I mentioned that the IVC filter was noted to be tilted. When we went back and carefully looked at the original CTA, there are clues, as you can see here, that the filter is indeed tilted. And this can make retrieval more challenging. And here are some representative intravascular ultrasound images from the second procedure. On the left, you can appreciate that the left external iliac vein is now free of thrombus. The left common iliac vein in the center image is compressed and stenosed. And post stenting, there is a significant luminal area gain. The patient continued to do very well, but we had to reattempt IVC filter retrieval. That was done on the third procedure on October 28, 2020. Due to the tilted nature of the filter, we utilized the loop wire snare technique. In the loop snare technique, a large straight sheath, ideally 12 French or larger, is advanced through that a curved catheter like the Omniflush or the sauce is advanced underneath the IVC filter as shown on the left. Through that, an exchange length glide wire is advanced back up and that glide wire is snared with a gooseneck snare, perhaps 15 millimeters or larger, and then withdrawn and externalized. Once that is done and you know that you have a good grip on the filter, you can advance your sheath down and attempt to capture the filter, which is exactly what we did. The retrieval is demonstrated on the left. One limb of the filter fractured and remained in situ, which was then snared separately, and the filter and the remaining limb are demonstrated on the right. 
The patient has remained on anticoagulation and has done very well to date. So here's a question. There is randomized controlled trial evidence to support mechanical thrombectomy A in acute DBTs involving the iliac and or common iliac vein, B in caval DBT, C in DBTs involving up to the popliteal vein, and D in DBTs involving the deep femoral vein. To answer this question, we can refer to the best conducted study to date. The TRAC trial, as originally designed, was essentially a negative study. 692 patients with an acute DBT, both fempop and iliofemoral, were randomized to receive catheter-directed therapy plus anticoagulation versus anticoagulation alone. At 6 to 24 months of follow-up, there was no significant difference in the primary endpoint of post-thrombotic syndrome. Subsequent analysis of the ATTRACT trial data showed that in patients with acute iliofemoral DVT, in other words involving the iliac vein and or common femoral vein, that compared to anticoagulation alone, catheter therapy led to lower post-thrombotic syndrome severity scores at 6 to 24 months without statistically significant higher rates of bleeding. So the correct answer, therefore, is A. There are several conclusions and important learning points in this case. First, there are data to support catheter intervention for acute DBT involving the common femoral or iliac veins in terms of reduction of PTS severity. may Turner syndrome is classically described to be the compression of an iliac vein by the overlying iliac artery anteriorly and vertebral bodies posteriorly. It may increase the risk of deep vein thrombosis. An indwelling IBC filter and Maythroner syndrome may contribute to DBT formation, independently, that is. Once an IBC filter is no longer indicated, retrieval is indicated. Stenting for Maythroner syndrome may lower the risk of recurrent DBT. In this case, particularly due to prior unprovoked PEs, the patient should remain on anti anticoagulation indefinitely.